recording or somebody should type it in the chat, I guess. Okay, welcome to um, the ggplot2 book club, the networks chapter. Um, I'm going to be talking about that chapter today. And notably, the chapter started with a warning not to read the chapter, um, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, it is definitely a work in progress, and I have some thoughts for changes to it. So we can also talk about that as we go along. Um, let's open up networks. Um, cool. So we're going to start out talking about a little bit like what is network data, and then we're going to talk about some new functions and geomes that are introduced by these packages for dealing with um, networks, and then we'll talk about visualization. Um, this chapter's a little bit all over the place. Stop me if you have questions, and I'll do my best to explain. Um, I work with networks in my um, PhD, and I've used TidyGraph and GGraph, GGGraph a little bit, um, but I definitely like learned some new stuff in this chapter as well, which was great. So the basic premise of this chapter is that we need to visualize network data using other packages, not just ggplot2. And the reason for that is because of how network data is structured, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so we're going to use the packages tidygraph and ggraph um, primarily. Those work in a tidy framework. So tidygraph is for like graph wrangling and manipulation of, of network data. And then GGraph is for network visualization. Um, so that's like the plotting side of things. It's sort of like an addition to ggplot that can handle network data. Um, iGraph is also briefly mentioned. I'm not going to go into details on iGraph because I personally find it really confusing and hard to use, but it's sort of the original like package for dealing with networks and visualizing networks in R. And it provides more of like a base R framework for graph visualization. So if you're more comfortable with base R, I mean, I guess this is the ggplot2 book, but if anybody wants to do network data and wants to use base R, you would use tidygraph, or sorry, iGraph. Okay, so what is network data? I thought I'd just start with like a little intro. We've all probably seen um, graphs like this one. So this is called a graph in, in mathematics. Like formally, this is a graph with nodes and edges. Um, more colloquially, we, we refer to this as a network. So network data consists of some entities, which are called nodes or vertices shown here in blue, and then the relationships between them, which are shown as edges or links, typically represented as lines, but we'll see there's some other ways to represent them in a minute. Um, the edges can have properties. They can be directed or undirected. They can be weighted or unweighted. And I thought I'd give some examples of real life data that can be represented as, as networks. So probably the most common is like a social network. So individuals, those blue dots would be like people. And then the edges could be friendships or relationships between them. You can imagine that making that directed too. Like if you had a graph of like romantic relationships or romantic feelings or something that could, you know, could be the line could go in both directions, but you could also have somebody having a crush on someone else and it's not reciprocated, in which case you'd basically have an arrow from one graph to from one dot to another. Um, another example of a directed graph would be a food web. So trophic relationships would be the edges between different species. So nodes don't have to be individuals. They can represent any entity. Plant pollinator networks are another type of graph that I won't go into, but that can be sort of a binary um, type of graph. Okay, so network data is special. It has to represent both nodes and edges, which means that it's really hard to represent in a traditional straightforward data frame format. There's two main ways of representing network data. I added this to the slides because I think the chapter really should have gone over this and didn't. Um, so there's two main like conceptual ways to represent network data and they roughly correspond to long format and wide format. So the long format for re representing network data is called an edge list. That's like the technical term is an edge list. It's not just a list of edges. It's, it's actually an edge list. Um, and that's a data frame with two minimum of two columns, um, usually three or more. So from and to, or you could have like node one and node two shows, you know, the edge is going to go from node. In this case, this is a self edge from node A to node A. Uh, down here, we've got like an edge from node B to node C. And then you might have a column showing the weight of that edge um, or some other properties of that edge, um, like whether it's, uh, I don't know, colored or in some category, which we'll see later. Um, and you see here that this 
is um, inherently directed. So this edge goes from A to B, and you would have to have a separate entry for the edge from B to A. Um, it's dealing with directed and undirected edge lists can get complicated. An adjacency matrix, which is sort of the wide format equivalent, is like if you put the froms along the columns and the twos along the um, the top or vice versa, and then you fill in the cross um, square with the weight of the edge or the presence of the edge. Um, so in this case, this is just a matrix of the, the presence of the edge without the weights. So we see that we have a, an edge from A to B. We see that we have one from B to C, and we have one from C to D. And then we don't have um, the rest of them shown. So these are not direct uh, translations of each other. Translating between edge lists and adjacency matrices is really a pain in the neck um, because they aren't exact. They don't represent exactly the same thing. So anyway, we, we'll see both of these formats popping up um, in the rest of this chapter, but we're mainly going to be dealing with edge lists because it's the long format, it's the tidy format, and it's really how GGraph um, represents things. Okay, so tidygraph is the package that we use for wrangling and manipulating network data. And it's a dplyr API, which means that it basically allows you to use dplyr functions um, to work with network data, and it introduces some new functions. The most important new function is activate. So that tells tidygraph whether you want to focus on the nodes part of the graph or the edges part of the graph. Um, the way that the data, the data is stored is sort of like two linked data frames, one with the node stuff and one with the edge stuff. And they're tied together, but it's not easy to represent them both in one graph. So um, activate basically says, okay, shift focus to either nodes or edges, and then we can work on it. And you can have a pipeline that has many different calls to activate. You can take your graph, you can activate nodes, do something with the nodes, then you can activate edges, do something with the edges, and vice versa as much as you want. You also have um, these special functions, dot n and dot e, which allow you to have access to the other thing when you're focusing on one um, type of data. So dot n gives access to the node data when you're activated on the edges data, and dot e gives access to the edges data when you're activated on the nodes data. And that can be important when you want to use mutate and summarize to like add um, to add data or work with data based on the attributes of the edges or the or the nodes. And then dot g accesses the whole graph. I They didn't really have examples of this in the chapter, and I've never used this, so I would need to dig more into when that would be relevant. Um, maybe like the density of the graph or something. I'm not sure. OK, so here's an example of creating a graph um, with tidygraph. Tidygraph also comes with some functions to generate random networks. There's lots of algorithms for generating random networks, which you might want to do if you just want to understand how to wrangle the data. One of them is called play GNP. So here we're just generating a random graph with 10 nodes. And I think this means the probability of an edge between any given pair of nodes is 0 0.2. So we take that graph and we say, let's pay attention to the nodes. And then we decide to add an attribute to those nodes by randomly sampling letters from um, you know A through D uh, to basically add like a group. Um, maybe we're going to be grouping our nodes by some attribute, whatever. And then we move over to the edges. And now we're focusing on the edges. We're working on the edges. But then we use this dot n function to arrange the edges by the class of the node. So you can see here why we need access to like we can't just activate the nodes if what we want to sort is the edges. We have to be activated. The we have to have the edges activated. But then we might, might want to refer back to node information in order to sort the edges. So here we're saying take the class variable that we just created of the node and use the from node because every edge will inherently have a from and a to. The edge is a, is a property of a dyad. It's not a property of a single node. So if we want to sort the edges by node properties, we have to tell it, do we want to sort by the from node or sort by the to node or some co combination of the two? 
Um, let me pause there for a second. How are we feeling so far about network data and about these new verbs? What questions do people have? I'm good. I think I'm understanding, especially this activate situation. I've seen it before, but I was like, I don't even know what's happening. I think you explained it really well. I would like to see the table, though, so that I can go. Um, so you're activating this part of the table, and then when you move to the edges, this is what you're activating, sort of. Yeah, um, of I guess I table. should have. Uh, so here, yeah, so here's the table. Um, I should have probably toggled back to my R so I could show this in real table in, in real time. I just figured I would probably be running out of time. But this is the edge data. So it's just got the from and the to. So this is telling us, you know, we have an we have an edge from node five to node one, from node one to node two, et cetera. So this is a pretty standard data frame. And then the and, and so this this importantly, this has one row per edge. Um and then the node data has one row per node. Um, so here we have a row for node one and then a row for node two and then a row for node three. And we can see we've added this class variable ABC for our nodes. There's apparently more rows. It's just showing it's cutting it off here. I think the best analogy I can think of is, does anyone have familiarity with databases, like relational databases? Yeah. So the the general idea here is that like you have two data frames and the reason that they can't easily be combined into one data frame is that the unit is different like the 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 key variable is is that what it's called the, the primary key is different um so the edges data frame has one row per edge but the nodes data frame has one row per node and that could be a drastically different number of um of rows. And so fundamentally, the information is being stored about a different entity. Now, you could do a join on those two and represent it as one data frame. So it would be reasonable to wonder why Tidygraph doesn't do that and like just pick the larger one and, and have, you know, repetitions of the information for the edges. And I, I don't know from a programming perspective, like why they chose to do it this way. But I'm just imagining, you know, what if you have 10 nodes and you have hundreds of edges. Um, and uh, I'm realizing that doesn't make sense because you could only have a maximum of 100. But OK, 10 nodes and, and many more edges. Let's say 10 nodes and 70 edges. So you have a 70 row data frame for the edges, which will repeat the nodes over and over. The first question is, if you were to join, are you joining by the from or are you joining by the to? Right? So you'd have to like duplicate it to have the edges, it's gonna, you're gonna maybe be missing information if the edges are directed and one node never shows up in the to or the from. So that's one issue. And then another issue is if you did somehow manage to do that join, um, you would then, if you ever wanted to extract information about the nodes, you'd have to do some sort of like um, distinct operation or some sort of simplification to just simply get the information on a per node basis. So it's really inefficient. It's the same reason that we have relational databases rather than just like a single table that duplicates information over and over. So yeah, it's a weird structure. Um, but the general, like here, when I ask it to show me this graph object, we can see the edge data comes first and it tells us that it's activated. If our last activate command had been to activate the nodes, then when we visualized the graph object, the node data would show up at the top and it would say active. So it literally like shifts which one you look at first. Another question I have, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm asking the questions, but if someone else has questions, please ask That's them okay. too. Maybe you will address this in the future, but the one thing I don't know how to do is those tables, right? Because I don't know what that one to like the from one to two, I don't know what that means. And how is it connected to the nodes? Because it's gonna be node A and it's gonna have a line, which is the edge, I suppose. And that A is gonna connect to B. Mm -hmm. How do I know that A to B should be a two? I, I don't know, I'm, a, I'm 
because you have letters and then you have numbers. So yeah, actually this is confusing. So the nodes actually are not, the, the letters are something we added separately. So inherently the nodes have numbers here in, in this graph. When we look at the edges, this is the name of the node. It's it's node five. That's the name of the node. Node five to node one. And then separately here in this mutate statement, we we manually added a variable called class, which we happen to define as letters, which ended up being A, B, and C. But there's no inherent like node A. Um, and so when we go down to the nodes data frame, I think it, it's just implicit that the first row is node one and the second row is node two. And then it shows the class as a variable, but there isn't a column that's like node ID. So then the line, super clear now. So the line, the strength of that line is going to be determined by how many times A and B are connected. Next right day, now, we don't have anything here for the weight okay. of the line. We we just have okay. everything's just going to be a single line with the same weight. Later, we'll okay. show like adding um, a weight to the edge. But um, but yeah, right now, it's just like a graph can be binary or weighted. So a binary graph is just is there an edge there or is there not an edge there? Yeah. And then a weighted graph also has like quantitative weights for the edges. So here, this is just a binary graph. Perfect. One last question. Sorry, Ashley, go, go, go. Um, so I guess this is just jumping off of Gabby's question. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're representing the graph data, specifically the edge data, yeah. will it always be like the from and to will always be numeric? Or would you be able to have like from, let's say you're doing a food web, mm -hmm. you're doing like from owl to mouse to represent like the owl eating the mouse? Good question. Um, I think, I mean, you certainly can, I'm not sure. So it's, I think it's going to be similar to like factors, how the underlying encoding is always numbers, but then you can have the levels be called whatever you want. I'm actually, I'm not totally positive about this and I would have to go in and check, but Sorry. I think probably it's always going to have some like underlying numeric but you could have other values in these columns and i think we're going to see some examples later where there's other values in the column so so i think i think the short answer is yes um that you can do something like that we'll, cool. we'll see yeah all right so let me move on a little bit um actually okay so this one also has numeric i guess we'll see but um this is an example of converting existing data to a graph object with gcraph so up here we generated a random graph with this function but usually we don't want to do that usually we want to use our own data and so here we're taking some data called high school and if we look at it we see that it's already in this nice edge list format these are students student one student 14 and um, then year tells us like which year we're talking about and i think these are like friendships or something so when we pass something that has this format to as table graph um we can tell it that we don't want the graph to be directed. This isn't like a crush that individual two has on individual 21. This is just like a friendship between the two individuals. And we take a look at our object that we just created. And we see that now the edge data has this additional attribute. It has a year and we have from and we have two. And then um, the node data, there isn't any because again, like, like we were talking about with Gabby's question, the node numbering is implicit. We're not going to have a, like a node ID column. The node IDs just are the values of from and to. If we had additional info about node data, like gender or age or class or anything like that, that would show up in node data, but we don't. Um, okay, so that's converting to table graph. Okay, here's another example that I'm actually gonna not spend a lot of time on. The person who made the slides before me spent a lot of time on this, but um, let's take some color space data and convert it into um, a graph. So this is colors represented with um, L, U, and V, which I think is, is it help luminosity? And I'm actually not sure what L, U, and V are, um, but this is some data that represents these colors as 
not RGB, but a different color space. And you can see that it has this format. So if we um, just plot the data based on U and V, um, we can see that it, and, and then color it, we can see that it looks like this. And so you're probably wondering, like, why are we talking about this with a graph? And I think what the person here was trying to get at is sometimes networks appear in places we wouldn't expect them. Um, and one example is that if anyone's ever done a clustering algorithm, um, the output of H clust is a dendrogram or is a like a tree, right? And that's a network. So any sort of like grouping structure like that is inherently also something you can represent as a network. So I think the takeaway here is supposed to be, we look at these colors and we say, huh, some of them seem to be more similar to each other than others. It would be nice if we could represent the similarities as a graph. Um, so we apply a clustering algorithm. Again, I'm speeding through this because it's not central. Um, and the output of um, this H clust function is an object of class H clust. And so as table graph, we'll understand how to transform an object of class H clust into a graph object. So when we do that, um, we are given a rooted tree with some node data. Um, and here we see that, again, we've got our node identities as the implicit row numbers, but then we have all sorts of properties of the um, of the nodes, we have height, we have leaf, label, how many members are in um, that uh, section of the tree. I'm not very familiar with dendrograms, but the point here is that it knows how to translate a clustering object into a network directly without you having to do a lot of extra work, which is very convenient. And then once again, we have our edge data. Dendrogram, remember that it starts from a matrix, if I remember correctly. Yep. So I think maybe that's what it's using, that matrix, the second example you gave us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah connection, and that would be a good yeah. connection to put in explicitly here. Like anything that's represented as a matrix can also be represented as a network. Like that's just fun. It's fundamentally the same type of data. Um. Okay. So algorithms. It took me a minute to understand what they meant by algorithms. Um, algorithms are just any operation you can do on a graph. And most of the algorithms that they showed here are examples of centrality calculations for nodes. There are others like calculating the edge density of a graph, but we're going to focus mainly on um, centrality. And I'm not going to go into all the different types of, of network centrality. That's like network theory stuff that's beyond the scope of this chapter. But basically, when you look at a graph, you can notice that some nodes are more connected than others. Um, some nodes might be might have more connections. Some nodes might have like fewer connections, but stronger ties, like, you know, heavier weights of the edges. Um, some nodes might not be connected to a lot of others, but they might be like in a central position of the network such that to get anywhere on the network, you have to pass through that node. Um, all this stuff has implications for disease and communications and all sorts of processes on networks. But again, that's beyond the scope. So there are many ways to calculate centrality. One example is page rank centrality, which is a centrality measure that Google uses um, in ranking pages on its home page. And it's based on number of links from one page to another. And then are the pages that you're linking to ones that also link to a lot of other pages. Anyway, it's a whole thing. So the point here, though, is that we can take a graph we can activate the nodes because we want to deal with the centrality of the nodes. And then we can use our very familiar dplyr verbs, such as mutate, to calculate the centrality of the nodes and add that as an attribute to the node data. So in this case, we're calculating page rank centrality, and then we're arranging by centrality. We don't have to do any weird thing here with like the dot n to, to arrange because we're already focusing on the nodes and we want to sort the nodes by a property of the nodes. So it's simple. It's just familiar dplyr verbs. Uh, we can look at this and we see that now we have a centrality column um, in our node data, but our edge data is still very simple. We don't have any properties of these edges. We just It just tells us it's from this node to this node. Okay. All right. Let's talk about visualization. Um, we'll see a little, uh, some more examples as we go along of like underlying graph operations. 
Okay, so we use ggraph to visualize network data. It builds on top of tidygraph and ggplot2 and attempts to give like a grammar of graphics for network data. It does a pretty good job. There are some like weirdnesses about it, but as we'll see. So the basic syntax of ggraph is very similar to ggplot. You take, um, you first make a call to ggraph instead of making a call to ggplot, and then you use geom underscore whatever. Um, the most common ones are geom node point and geom edge link, but we'll see um, a lot of others as well. By default, it's going to choose an appropriate layout for the graph. So if you if you give it something that is like a dendrogram object, it will automatically um, do that. If you give it something that's a straightforward network, it will give you like the default layout. But um, as we'll see in a minute, there's many other types of layouts. This is the guide to layouts if anybody wants to go dive into that because there's a lot of complexity with layouts. Here's some examples of a layout. So when you specify a layout, you can either um, give it a character string to pick one of the um, default layouts, or you can give it literally a data frame of coordinate values um, generated by a function or manually put in yourself um, to tell it where to put the points. And actually, I want to back up for a second and talk about like what even is a layout. So points in a like nodes in a graph are kind of analogous to points um, on a different type of ggplot, except that we're really used to making graphs where the points have a specific x and y value and where you put them is really important and that is the information. But in a network, the specific x and y value of the coordinates is like not really the main thing. Um, and it's usually not something that you're gonna specify manually. Usually you care about the relationships between the different nodes more than you care about their actual location. There's some exceptions to that where you might wanna force the points to be in a specific place, such as um, geographically specific networks. So if you wanted to measure, if you wanted to visualize like a map with airports as the nodes, and then the edges ha have some weight based on like number of flights between the airports, then you might want to tell it, okay, put this node specifically in this X, Y position. But for the vast majority of cases, you're not doing that. And so you just want a layout that will accurately represent the graph structure in a way that's easy to see. So um, here's an example of a graph with a default layout. We just do ggraph on this graph of high school relationships that we made earlier. And we add, this is sort of the simplest we can get, right? ggraph, we add geom, ed geom edge link, which draws simple lines. Geom node point draws simple points. We have our, our fun default uh, gray background that we love so much from ggplot. Um, and uh, we didn't say anything about the layout. So it just gives us a default layout based on um, the relationships of the points to each other. There's some algorithm, I don't know. But we can get more complicated. Um, so in this example, we take our high school graph, we activate the edges, we add some random edge weights. These don't mean anything, they're just random numbers. And the reason we added those is I wanted to show an example of, um, of um, actually making the edge weights understood as weights and scaling the alpha of those, um, of those edges based on the edge weight itself. So now we see some of the edges being like darker than others. And then we also see here that we've specified a different layout than the default. We've called it layout equals stress. I don't know exactly how this works, but there's some underlying principle. It's like, if you imagine putting a spring on, if you imagine the edges are springs, like literal physical springs, and you uh, imagine, okay, how would this lay itself out if we allowed the areas with more springs to like pull tighter and then the areas with fewer springs to sort of branch out? I think that's what's going on under the hood. Um, basically be glad that you don't have to manually figure out how to visualize this stuff because it's a huge pain and we're glad we have algorithms. Stress is just one example of a layout that you can pass. There are many other possibilities. So here's a layout called DRL. I don't know what that is. You can read more about it here. Um, it You can see it looks different. This is the same data, but it looks different than the previous layouts that we had. All of these examples have been 
passing the layout in as an argument to, um, sorry, I'm, okay. Examples here have been passing the layout in as a character string, as an argument to the GGraph function itself. But then this DRL one, this is an example of a different way you can pass a layout in. You can create the layout separately up here. And then you can pass the layout in as a layout object to GGraph. Um, and you'll notice here that now we don't have to say GGraph of high school graph, whereas before we had to have that be the data argument to GGraph, because the layout contains the graph data too. It's like the graph data with an explicit X and Y attached to it. Um, I really should have put uh, a, a, a part here where we could examine the layout object to see what it looks like. And I'm sorry that I didn't. Um, I will add that to the slides after the fact. But yeah, it's basically a more complicated data frame that has the nodes and it attaches like a specific position to each one so that then GGraph knows what to do with that. Here's another one. Um, so here we are using create layout and we're using this layout called Kamada Kawai. Again, this is a different algorithm um, here. So this example actually is creating a graph with iGraph instead of creating a graph with tidygraph. And I think the reason that they included this example is just to show that these are interoperable. Tidygraph and GGraph will understand iGraph objects. So if anyone is already working with iGraph, you can do that. Um, but yeah, we can. If you're not already working with iGraph, don't start. Just, just don't start. Trust me. You will regret it. All right, some more interesting stuff. Um, so we start making a graph. We pass it this layout object that we made. And then here we're adding some colors to Geome Edge Link. And just as we might expect from ggplot, we do that using AES, using our aesthetic specifications. We're telling it to color by year in this case. And we can see um, the edges that appear um, colored by the year that they are associated with. Uh, I'm going to skip this. This is a section on how iGraph works, and I don't care right now. Um, so circular layouts, uh, this is something I've never had to use, but if you're making, for example, a phylogenetic tree, you might care about this. Um, I think the point of this section is to point out that we do have a circular equals true option in GGraph for our layout. And it's important to use that if you want to get something that looks like this, as opposed to something that looks like this with the edges all curved, which is what you would get if you instead used chord polar. Um, which is how you would transform a different type of graph to a circle in ggplot. So you might expect this would be the way to do it, but you'll notice that this curves the edges in addition to curving the, the layout of the nodes. This isn't necessarily like wrong. It's just kind of hard to interpret these edges. They're all over the place. So um, this one just curves the nodes, does not also curve the edges. Not much more to say on circular, I think. All right, let's talk more about drawing points. So as we discussed previously, nodes are similar to points, but we don't usually care explicitly about their X and Y position. We just care about putting them on the graph and our layout takes care of the position. Um, to draw nodes, it's usually geom node point. There's also geom node tile, which I've never used and kind of can't imagine wanting to use. I think there's also a couple others. Um, there might be some like label options. Here's an example of our colors uh, dendrogram here. We're using stress as the default layout and we're adding geom edge link. So we haven't done anything special with the edges yet. And then geom node point. And here we're coloring by this members variable that we had in our original data set, um, which uh, in, our, in our clustering data set, which shows how many members are in each of the um, uh, groupings, the each of the, what do you call the the clades on the tree. Um, and you can see here that we're coloring our nodes from uh, least members in, uh, in red up to most members in magenta. We can also color nodes by centrality. This is something we want to do pretty often. Um, 
Here, these are colored by what's called power centrality. I actually have no idea what that is. Like I said before, there are many definitions of centrality, degree centrality, strength centrality, eigenvector centrality, whatever. Um, but in this case, we're coloring by power centrality. And again, you see our old familiar default continuous colors here. So just like with ggplot2, it's going to take discrete colors when you have a factor. It's going to take continuous colors when you are coloring by a numeric, and it will give you your legend. And we see that these are the most powerful nodes down here, and then these are the least powerful nodes out here, whatever that means. OK, we can also make tiles. Um, I don't know why we want to do this. Maybe a computer file system. That's the only time I've ever seen this used. I'm going to skip over this because it's probably not that useful to people. I think I've also seen tiles if you wanted to look at like um, like the diversity of different clades, like number oh, of species okay. within like birds versus mammals or something like that. Okay, yeah, I, I guess that shows that I should not assume uh, things based on my own expertise. That's a great example. <laughs> I've never seen this used, but yeah, I can totally see why that would be a valuable thing. Um, okay, so edges. There's a lot of different options for drawing edges. We're not going to look at all of these, but um, you know, you're probably noticing the pattern geom underscore edge underscore something. Um, the default is geom edge link, but there's a whole bunch of others. Um, Geom Edge Link draws straight lines between the connected nodes. And it's worth noting that under the hood, that's a line that's like split up into small fragments, which allows for things like color gradients, which we'll see in a minute. Um, lots more information on edges here. This is an example of some edges. So somebody, the person who did these slides before me had this example in here, and I didn't understand it, so I left it in hopes that we could talk about it if anyone else gets it. This after stat thing, does anyone know what this is? Because I tried reading the documentation and I was very confused. It's some sort of like new version of like um, stat equals identity or something, but I don't really know what it is. Okay, I'm seeing head shakes. So identity... The only thing that it does is that it preserves the value that you have there. Yeah. So unless that's what they are doing, whatever you have as index, do not multiply it by anything. Do not add them to anything. Just the value that you have in index, preserve right. that number. Maybe okay, that's so what you're doing, because that's what the identity does. Do you maybe remember reading something like that? I think it's probably something like that. So again, what would be helpful here is if I were showing the high school graph data, because I don't know what this index variable is. I think maybe the index variable, I think, you know, I think index isn't, I think I looked into this and there was no index variable. So I got confused. So maybe index is a shorthand for like the row number or something. Um, yeah, I don't really know what's going on here. I think maybe I'm going to put that as a... Um, question because I think this was included in the chapter and they didn't yeah. explain it much um and I remember thinking that it was very confusing yeah I remember that as well um I thought I thought as well I was like oh maybe it's like the row number but then if it was the row number each node like the the edges should go towards the same gradient at each node so like each node should be light or dark, right? Depending on the index number, but edges will have different directionality in the example they gave in the book. So like, it doesn't make sense for it to be like row number, although that is the most logical like index. I don't know. I'm, I was also very confused by index. Yeah, I don't know what's up with this. Um, you're right, because this is demonstrating a gradient. So maybe the, maybe the goal of including this example was to show that gradients are possible and that they happen when you when you give an edge aesthetic that corresponds to the characteristics of the note I don't I don't know um yeah yeah, right. yeah I mean, that, that's what it said is it it said like under the hood it'll split up the line in a bunch of small fragments and it is possible to use that to draw a gradient along the edge for right. example to show direction 
So like, but I, I think it's just the, the example, like that part I understand, but the example I don't understand because I don't yeah. understand what after sad index is. Exactly. <laughs> right. I, I mean, what I'm wondering, and you're, you're totally right about how, if it were row number, like it would look the same going into each. I wonder maybe if it's like the differential between the two nodes, like for example, could it be that this node is much, this node's value of index or whatever is significantly lower than this one. And so we have a strong gradient from dark to light here, but then for like this edge here, there's not as mm -hmm. strong a gradient because the value of node is, the value of this node is not as different from this one. I'm not sure. I think we should move on yeah. from this example, but I, I think, yeah, we're okay. all confused and <laughs> should add a pull request or something because I don't know what's going on. Um, okay, more explicit example of interpolating edge colors. So before we move on, before we go to the plot, I wanted to show another example here of like wrangling the underlying graph data because that's like hard in and of itself. So once again here, we're creating a new random graph using play GNP, same parameters as before, 10 nodes, and I think 0 0.2 is the probability of an edge. Then we activate the nodes so we can work on the node properties. Once again, we add a class um, to the nodes, randomly sampling between um, A and D, and then we activate the edges. So I guess this is probably the same underlying code as before, I'm now realizing, whoops. Um, and so once again, we use this dot n predicate to uh, arrange the edges based on the properties of the from node. Then we're gonna interpolate colors between the nodes. And I think the I think it's that Geome Edge Link 2 does this better than Geome Edge Link. I another place where I stumbled in this chapter and was really confused was the difference between Geom Edge Link and Geom Edge Link 2. Um, they're, they each have like different ways that they refer to things too, uh, which I got, which got me really turned around. But what I know what's happening here is that we're taking our graph, we're using the stress layout, then we're adding our edges. And this is important to pay attention to, the node.class uh, variable because this is a special kind of variable here that's recognized by Geom Edge Link and Geom Edge Link 2. The reason that it's relevant that it's Geom Edge Link 2 is that the way that this is specified is different between Geom Edge Link and Geom Edge Link 2. I don't know. Um, but anyway, here it's telling the it's telling R to color the edges by the class variable of the nodes. This is sort of similar to this thing, dot n parentheses dollar sign class. I don't really understand why we don't use this here. It would seem like it would make more sense if we just had one way of referring to the node attribute, but instead we seem to have two different ways of referring to the same concept, and I don't understand why but it's probably some underlying thing about like tidy eval or something like that. Um, but I think the important thing to realize that it took me a while to realize is that this is not a variable called node.class. Like if you went to the graph data, you would not see a node.class variable. You would see a, a variable called class in the nodes data frame. Does that make sense? Questions about this? Yeah. Um, I so I I think when you're calling the node class, like I think it only it only looks at the nodes, but like basically the from and to nodes of a certain edge, and maybe that's why we have to use yeah. the like dot n in the previous code block. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, so like this is maybe referring to the entire vector. Yeah, maybe that's the only way you can isolate the from. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe. I think there is a way to... I think there is a way to modify this. Like I think if you do node.class.2 or something or node.class.1, 
it, it would color by just the class of the, the to or the from node. Um, but I don't remember how to do that. But here, the fact that we don't specify just the from or the to means that it's going to interpolate the color because, you know, node one might have a different class than node two. In this case, we have an edge that's between two nodes that are both class C. So this edge just has one color. But in, in many of these cases, most of these cases, the edges go between nodes of different classes. Um, so the color changes. I think this example would be a lot clearer. Um, and I actually would, this is another example of where I would suggest a change to this chapter. I think this, this example would be a lot clearer if they chose something, if they chose a more informative variable name, because class sounds like it's some technical R thing, but it's actually not. It's just, we happen to name this variable class. So if instead these were like cats and they're, they're instead of a class, it was like pelt color or something. Um, then, and, and we literally had like black cats and orange cats and white cats. And then our interpolation was like from the black cat to the orange cat. Like that would be much clearer as to like what's going on. Um, That's anyway. a perfect example. So if anyone creating the book is, has just, you know, is watching this, please do the cat example that Kaya just said, because with cats there, it would be beautiful. And I think you're right, because then it would be, um, this is like such a pet peeve I have with um, uh, data scientists in general that us ecologists don't have that because we we work in the re not that they don't work in the real world but we work in such a concrete world with yeah. animals outside the environment that we are so used to touching things but they are used to just seeing things in in screens in you know on screens on computers etc. So they don't really think about the real world when they're coming up with these examples. So I think, I think if you can put that in the um, in the pull request, do it because it's not that they don't um, that they cannot come up with these examples. Just they don't see that they do these things with yeah. the names of the objects that you just said. They just don't see it, right? Sure. So yeah, put it. Yeah, and it's occurring to me now that if I did do something like that, cat's example, that also brings up potential confusion with like literal colors versus like mapping of colors. Like let's say we had a black cat and an orange cat, um, but you're going to have the classic ggplot thing where if you color the nodes by, by the color column, it's not going to be literally black and orange. It's going to be like red mapped to black and like blue mapped to orange. And so maybe if, maybe that would give an opportunity for like the identity aesthetic thing where we want to color explicitly by the value of the column and we could show those two different examples you anyway. like cat breed or something like that yeah cat breed something not color right cat breed yeah. or or like even speed we could do like a network of species and then, yeah you know the genus or the the family or something like that yeah yeah okay Moving along, um, yeah, I, I included this quote from the chapter, edge geomes have access to the variables of the terminal nodes through specially prefixed variables, and that's what this is. This is a specially prefixed variable. Um, but yeah, I think this just, again, underscores this concept of like the problem, why network data is so hard is that each edge corresponds to two nodes. And so if you want to like deal with attributes of the node based on the edges or attributes of the edge based on the nodes <clears throat> it's like not obvious how to how to do that okay <clears throat> now we get to the sort of just like fun aesthetics part um lots of other types of edges geom edge parallel um if there's like multiple edges between two nodes I, this seems like a not very practical thing to use but it makes a nice art piece i guess um, I'm sure there's ways you could adjust the spacing and make it informative and stuff. Um, more to the point, there's uh, something like Geom Edge Elbow, which allows for things like dendrograms. So this creates, instead of a straight line edge, it creates an elbow edge. Um, and here again, we're using, uh, we're using Love Graph, which is already a dendrogram. We tell it we want a dendrogram layout, which is a type of layout that already exists in GGraph. And then I guess it needs height as 
the as an argument to GGraph, and there is already a height parameter in the stendergram, which we got from HCLUST. So we're telling it to use the height variable as the height um, of the nodes. Yeah, I really like that. It, or, I find that example is particularly helpful because, like, thinking of uh, like if you wanted to just do like a quick phylogeny without like doing your own phylogenetic analysis, like you can do branch lengths or you can do like age of yeah. different like fossil species or whatever really easily using that height argument. Oh, good point. Because right. I mean, I'm, I'm like trying to think back to when I did this because because you could represent the tree. The tree can look different based on what you try choose to scale it by like yeah. Level or yeah. rate of evolution or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm glad you're bringing in these examples because I don't use tree data very often. So it's like helpful to have somebody who does. The only way I've seen it used though some dendrograms is with similarity. So if yeah. you have ecosystems and how similar they are based on species richness, abundance, blah, blah. So the height is how similar or dissimilar, right? They are. But I guess that could also be applied to um how two people like if you were to do your network like let's think of twitter or any social media how distant you are based on how many interactions you have with all of the people that you are following or all your followers mm -hmm. the distance can be how many interactions you have or how many i don't know how many times in a month or something or throughout your entire life someone else has it is interacting with your posts or something so yeah i think yeah. i've never connected the two together like uh dendrogram which i'm very familiar with are the same thing as a network i have never made that connection before in my life until right now so i i was today years old <laughs> when i when i made the connection yep. my brain is just <laughs> connecting those two things Anyway, super cool stuff. Awesome. All right, a couple other small things. Um, you can clip edges around the nodes and they give the example of wanting to do this with arrows so that the arrows don't just like run into the nodes and get gross. Um, I think this is a good example of, like once we get to this level of knowledge, I'm just gonna be looking it up every time. Um, like it wouldn't occur to me that it would be end cap and start cap for for the geom edge link. I yeah, that's and then circle. I guess what's happening is that you have a circle around the node that you're then stopping the edge when you get there, but it's not obvious to me why that would be a property of the edge instead of being a property of the node. So I don't know. But it's cool. You can make a really pretty thing. And this is another example of a directed graph here. Um, what graph are we even? I don't remember where this graph. I think this is one of our randomly generated graphs from before. It would be good to make that clearer. Um, but yeah, yeah so we this is the same graph that they use for the um, the interpolation of the node colors. Yeah. It like fish shaped. Um, it looks like a fish. I mean, that's irrelevant. The, it does the, look the, like a fish. Whatever. It's even got the little, like, a perculum. Yeah. Perfect. Great fish. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. <laughs> All right. So edges are not always lines. Um, I think we're almost at the end here. So, um, yeah, edges are not always lines. Um, remember back to our adjacency matrix when, with our wide format data where we had the from on the down and the two across, and then we had a dot. Uh, or some weights. So here they're literally representing an adjacency matrix as points on a screen. Um, so these would be our edges from, and these would be our edges to, and we see a bunch of um, nodes here. And they're sort of, they're, they're using a matrix layout here. Um, they're still passing the graph in as the same graph object. They're not taking adjacency matrix as an object. Um, iGraph sometimes uses adjacency matrices as as your inputs, but GGraph doesn't. But then they're using matrix as the layout, so there's computations happening under the hood. And then there's you can sort. I, I there are sort functions. I don't know what this one is, um, but there are many sort functions. Um, 
Can anyone think of a time that they would want to represent a graph this way? I, I was having trouble thinking of an example where this would be like a useful visualization. Like you said before, when you have graphs, you talk about density versus sparsity. Uh, good point. So you could just have a quick visualization of like the edges where they cluster. I guess if you were to cluster, another example is maybe if your nodes are like um, time, like seasons or time points and you wanted to see whether like time points group together or not. Um, or if you're, if you wanted to order, if you have species and you order them by taxonomy and then you see whether most of the edges are between closely related species or whether it's kind of spread out could maybe work. Um, okay, and then faceting is also cool. They give this example here of different years in the high school data. Um, it works the same as faceting in a different type of ggplot. So in this case, we're faceting by year. It's got to be um, a property. I think it's got to be a property of the nodes. I don't, I'm actually not sure if you could facet. Would it even make sense to facet by... A property of the of the oh no this is a property of the edges yeah so I don't know what would happen if you also had different points from year to year so in this case we have everybody represented in both years I think like for example up here these two individuals we still have the same individuals up here but the edges relating to them are different so I'm not sure if you could also do oh so this I'm answering so this my would own be to say, this is facet edges. Yeah. So this is to see if the friendship remains, let's yeah. say, between at, uh, node one and two. They were not friends, let's say. That's the one that you were signaling above. But they were, they were not friends in 1957, but now they are in 1958. Mm -hmm. um, so I think right. this, I didn't know that you could facet it. It's super cool because then you can actually see temporally we we'll always talk about spatial temporal right but we can actually see temporally the what word to use here the the start um the continuation of the relationship between things right yeah through time i think this is super cool it's really nice um it's very relevant to some stuff that i do with um temporal networks and multi-layer networks which are notoriously hard to visualize so this is this is really useful. And I guess if you did facet nodes, you could also, um, you know, you, if you had a property of the nodes, like some individuals only appear in one year or the other, then you could use facet nodes. Um, what I'm not sure about is whether you could do both. Um, like what if you had different relationships I want to go back and try this now. If you have different relationships in the two different years and you also have different people in the two different years, um, can you somehow represent both of those in the same? Like give me an example, like let's say uh, node one and node two were friends before and then they became, you know, an item, a romantic relationship or something. Sure. Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah, or like if um, if you have, let's say you have this example, but then you also have, like some of these nodes don't appear in 1957, but they do appear like there's new people who join the class in 1958. So you have both changes in the relationships between people who were there in both years. And then you also have literally new people added. Um, so it's a, I would have to play around with like, could you include both of those types of information in, in your facet? And I think you could, um, but it might require some reordering of, of your functions. Um, okay, it's it is the hour, so I want to. Oh, perfect. All right, we're at the conclusions. Um, network data is awkward to represent in tidy format, but so we use tidy graph and ggraph to do that. Um, we have data represented as linked data frames of nodes and edges. We've got a couple special verbs that we have to pay attention to for graph manipulation. Layouts you can choose from one of the ones that already exists, or you can create your own layout. Um, and pass it in as a graph, sorry, as a data frame. Um, 
you can represent edges in lots of different ways. You can style them in lots of different ways. And then you can also use iGraph, which we did not go over different plotting framework. Um, more resources on all of this. Uh, Data Imaginist is the blog um, of the person who created Tidygraph and GGraph. I really, rep I really recommend this website. It's very, very helpful and has really good vignettes. So um, I think actually more than this book, I would represent, I would recommend that you just go check that out. Um, I hope that was somewhat helpful. And um, now I have thoughts for how to improve these slides more. So maybe I will make a second PR. And with that, we will end. Thank you so much, Kaya. Thank you everyone for joining. Derek, you're always welcome to be here. I am so glad to see that it's not just us four, but that you have been coming here week after week. So we super appreciate and value all your input because you are you are data scientists, if I remember correctly, Derek, right? I hope I'm not misrepresenting you here. Yeah, yeah, mathematical mind, but um, the reason I haven't committed is because my semester starts next week. Yeah, you are a data scientist, right? I teach it, yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. So you, any any input, any bits <laughs> of, you know, data science information, please share them with us. We're very eager to learn. Thank you so much, Kaya, for this, because I am going to be honest with you, without you, Colin and Ashley, we're all very smart, intelligent people, but without your guidance here, I don't think we could have made it through this chapter. No. So thank you, Kaya. It's so thank you for your... Um, yeah, and I've got a fair bit of network experience and I still found it hard. So yeah, I might put in some suggestions for changes. Yeah, yes. that's nice. I don't even know why this is in the book, to be honest with you, but anyway. Yeah, Ashley, you wanted to say something? It would have been totally reasonable for them to just be like, look, ggplot doesn't cover networks. Please go read these wonderful articles on mm -hmm. these other websites. Um, I'm not really sure why they didn't do that. So whatever. Yeah. Um, Derek and I are both in the the Effect book club, which is like Wednesday mornings or two hours before this meeting starts. Um, and one of that is directed, directed acyclic graphs is pretty much like the entire first half of the book. And so I was reading this and it's like, I understand what's happening. My two book clubs are colliding. Yeah, those are not easy to understand either. Um, so yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. Um, it was like, yeah. oh, I could make these in G, in G graph now. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> um, Okay, you guys, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Colleen, Ashley, Kaya. Thank you for your guidance here. Derek, thank you also for joining us. And I don't know what you want. we have next week, but I will send an announcement on Slack, and then I will see everybody next week. I'll write stuff in the chat.